Get used to it. That's just how it is. That's not how the world works, honey. It's just how we do things here. Well, life isn't fair. How many times have you heard one of these phrases? When did it come up? What were the circumstances that led you to ask such a question that would get such a response? A question that questioned a standard or the way things were? And I do actually want you to think of an example. When I was writing this, I was kind of sad because m many moons ago, sometimes I would like to offer, ask you to show a show of hands or to share something, share an example. But since I cannot do that, I hope if you feel like it, you can show, raise your hand so we can have that connection virtually. But I'll have to trust that you've thought of your example of when you've heard one of these phrases. The moment or moments you are thinking of could have happened when you were a child or could have happened earlier today, and most likely, you can probably think of a few examples. These are moments when your intellectual understanding of the world and how it should operate are directly challenged by an experience and trigger something in us to say, but wait, this isn't fair. This isn't how it should be. And so often, the response from another person who we've decided to express this idea to is shut down. Perhaps in an, as a way to promote acceptance of the situation, ending the challenge to it altogether. Now I want you to think of a time when you have been the one to say one of those phrases. Get used to it, that's just how it is. You're being sensitive. What had someone questioned that made you say that? Because I also think we all have probably many examples. They might be harder to think of because they may have impacted us less personally. We've all had those moments where we have also uttered those words to someone else. Perhaps our instinct comes from a good place, from not wanting to rock the boat or wanting to help the other person learn what to expect so that they aren't disappointed in the future. Maybe it comes from a place of fear of not wanting to question the system of which we are a part. Ironically, perhaps, we contributed to these questions that arise about how the world works. When someone says, this isn't fair, this isn't right, this isn't how it's supposed to be, it's because our society, at some point, maybe we as parents, we may have learned it from our parents, from other places, we as humans teach and have been taught that there are certain rules that should be followed in the adult world. We speak of building a just society, we teach our children to be kind, and they quickly see that this is not how every adult behaves. In an excerpt from a very famous All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten by Robert Fulgham, we are reminded of many of the lessons we were taught as youngsters. Share everything, play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you found them, clean up your own mess, don't take things that aren't yours, say you're sorry when you hurt somebody, wash your hands. How long does it take us as children to realize that these things that adults say, these values they express, the whole world does not follow these rules. Maybe no one does at all. So why is it that when we question the way things are, when they aren't matching up with those things that we were told as young children, why is it that we are often told, or even as adults now often say, get used to it? I warn you, I know what I'm about to say is going to be unsatisfying, but I don't have an answer to that question for you tonight about why that is what we say, why we give up those ideals that we teach children at so young, that people should share, that things should be fair, that people should be kind, that people should clean up after themselves or say they're sorry or acknowledge their, their shortcomings. I don't have an answer for why we don't stick with that. What I can tell you is that saying that's just the way it is or get used to it or life isn't fair, it's not a Jewish response. Now that doesn't mean that we as Jews don't often utter these words, I certainly have and I'm sure I will again, though hopefully I remember this lesson. But it doesn't make it a Jewish answer just because Jews do say it. 
We're 12 chapters into Genesis right now in the Torah, Parshat Lech Lecha. And we've already seen in these first 12 chapters, time and time again, the opposite of this idea that we must challenge the status quo. Starting from the moment of creation, God brings the world and life itself into being from nothing, from chaos, from void, and says, huh, I wonder what else there could be, and creates something new, something different. We as humans are made in God's image, and we too are creators, told that we can make things. We can make food. We till the earth. We humans can turn an idea into an action. We can build civilizations and so on. Then we get to the first humans, Adam and Eve, who are expelled from, the, from Eden for eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which in Judaism, we don't have this idea of original sin. We don't see that as the worst thing they could have done. We see, wow, these humans then had knowledge. They were able to go into the world, even if it was a punishment, and to create something new themselves. They kept moving forward. Their curiosity for rules that didn't quite make sense, do not eat from this tree. Why can I eat from every other tree? It doesn't make sense. Why can't I eat from this tree? Their curiosity for rules that didn't quite make sense led to human understanding and change in the world. And here we are this week in the Torah, having made it through last week, the flood survived by Noah and his family in the animal kingdom, past the dispersal of humanity around the globe after the Tower of Babel, And we meet our patriarch and our matriarch, Avram and Sarai, later to receive new names from God, becoming Abraham and Sarah, but I will often refer to them as Avram and Sarai tonight because of where in the Torah portion I'm speaking of them. But when we meet Avram, we know almost nothing about this most important man. We only know of his 10-generation genealogy from Noah to him, which mentions he was born. It tells us he has a wife whose name is Sarai and that they have no children. And then we read the words, Vayomer Adonai el Avram, and God said to Avram, Lech Lecha, go forth from your land, your birthplace, the place that raised you, the place that made you who you are. Leave that place from your father's house to a land that I will show you. The Torah gives us no indication of Avram's childhood, any experiences, how he was raised, or what he thought about. And so our rabbinic sages took creative license to fill in the gaps. In particular, they asked this question of why was Avram the first person that God said, Lech Lecha? Why was Avram the person that God chose? to leave everything he knew behind, to go on this journey to a place he doesn't even know yet. The Torah has not revealed that this place is Canaan just yet. So why did Avram say yes? Medieval commentator Maimonides imagines Avram as a very young boy in Mesopotamia, as a deep thinker and an asker of the questions of how and why. He suggests that Avram would wonder would wonder to himself, How is it possible that the spheres, the planets, move constantly without there being a mover or one to turn it? For it's impossible that it turns itself. How remarkable, Maimonides comments, all the more so because Avram had no one teaching him this worldview. He was immersed in a culture of idol worship and knew nothing else, knew nothing of a one God. Avram's understanding the world is chalked up to his own intelligence by Maimonides, a result of Avram's innate curiosity and ability to piece together the naturally occurring puzzles he saw in the world around him. I like to imagine Avram as a young, young boy asking his parents, why why do people worship idols when it seems as though they can't do anything, they're just statues? And I imagine his parents answering, because that's the way it is, that's what we do, that's who we are. Instead of accepting that answer, the sages imagine Avram of having a different response in a story so famous, many people assume it comes straight from the Torah instead of where it actually comes from, which is rabbinic literature much later. It's a story of Avram and his father's idol shop. His father was someone who carved idols and sold them to others. Terach, his father, had left on an errand and he had told his, asked his son to hold down the fort. Avram took the opportunity of being alone in the idol shop to teach his father a lesson, a bold move. But he wanted to challenge the narrative that he had always heard, that idols were gods. 
And so, what I believe would be a great video montage, he smashes every idol but one, leaving the largest one intact. When his father returned, he was furious. Terach asked, what have you done? And Avram said, me? Can't you tell it was the idol? I didn't do this. That idol destroyed all the other ones. Terach said, the jig is up. An idol can't do that. So Avram asked him, then why do you worship something that can't do anything? The tale does not inform us of Terach's reaction to his son. Perhaps that's a modern midrash, one of we can write together. I wonder if he was in awe. I wonder if he was furious. I'm guessing that was there somewhere. Or maybe he realized his son had a great argument. I like to imagine that this was the beginning of a shift for Terach's thinking. He had a lot to lose by embracing Avram's viewpoint, but also Avram had a point. Why was the world like this? So why Avram? He was one of the first people to see that the assumptions humans held about the world and the way it worked didn't make sense. And not only that, but that he too could exist in the world with a different understanding, even if others believe differently. Maimonides imagines that from this realization on, Avram took it upon himself to teach others about the one God, and it eventually became something he and Sarai did together. Things did not go well in this imagination for Avram, eventually being chased out of where he lived, according to our sages. There were those who attempted to attack him and challenge his ideas and tell him, no, you're wrong, this is not, this is our our worldview. This is the only thing we're willing to see. We will not change. And at this time when Avram was under attack by others, that's when we imagine God saying, Lech Lecha, go forth. And please do not think that Avram's journey, just because Avram was with God as a companion on this journey with Sarai, does not mean that Avram's journey was easy. Once they arrived in the promised land, they did make it to Canaan. There was a famine only a few sentences later in the Torah. And they ended up going to all, of all places, Egypt, Mitzrayim, Hebrew word meaning narrow place, where they faced many difficulties. Perhaps the lesson here in Lech Lecha is not to remind us that we just need to follow the call to go forth and trust that things will be okay. Rather, it teaches us that we must go forth, yes. And that may lead to Mitzrayim, to narrow places. But we must go forth, accepting that there will be difficulty, accepting that people may not see the world as we see it, may not be ready for a message of justice and change and equality. But that is the Jewish way. So when you hear the words that's just the way it is or find yourself about to utter them, remember, that's not a Jewish answer. We Jews seek to look for what doesn't make sense in the world for what reason tells us shouldn't be, to look for suffering and to not accept it and say this is just how it is. Instead, we are taught to address it. We want to, instead of being the ones who say that's just how it is, we want to be the ones who ask the questions that lead to change. Instead, asking, how can this be? How can we allow this? Whether you realize it or not, those things you question in society that make you ask, why is the world this way? Those things are God's still small voice within you saying, lech lecha, go forth. The world does not have to look this way. What can you do to address it yourself? Following Shabbat, we will go forth not knowing what this week has in store for our country, but we know no matter what, we will continue to challenge the status quo, fight to protect the endangered civil rights of women, minorities, those who identify as LGBTQ. We will not accept the answer that's just the way it is. Because to be a Jew is to have hope for a better future and to also admit and acknowledge and commit that we're here to help create that world. Kenya Hiratzon, may this be God's will. Lech lecha, go forth.